Humans have always had a generally curious nature when it comes to the world around us, and that has led to the beliefs in some very bizarre things during less informed times. Things like lambs growing on trees, animals spontaneously generating, and Brussels sprouts harboring evil spirits. Without further ado, let's take a dive into some of the weirdest things people actually used to believe. Evil spirits live in Brussels sprouts. Do you dread the annual ritual of facing a pile of Brussels sprouts at Christmas dinner? Back in the day, people feared Brussels sprouts far more than you do, and not just because they didn't like the taste. You see, there was once a time in medieval Europe when tiny demons were thought to be making their homes between the leaves of Brussels sprouts. Once inside, they lay waiting for some unsuspecting human to chow down on the veggies so that they could enter their body, making them very ill, or at the very least giving them a wicked stomach ache. Ever wondered why people take the painstaking effort to cut a tiny cross into every Brussels sprout's bottom before tossing them in the pan? Apparently, that was the best way to purge the veggies of their inherent evil. It was thought that this Christian symbol would drive the evil spirit out from the leaves, making them safe to eat. Although the tradition has continued into modern day, many chefs have since stated that carving a cross into your Brussels sprouts will only make them go soggy. So unless you really believe a demon is hiding in there, perhaps it's time to retire that particular custom. But where did this wacky belief come from? It stems back to the even funnier pagan view that farts were a sign of demonic possession. And since Brussels sprouts tended to make people fart, they had to be evil. Thank goodness baked beans weren't around back then. Psst. I heard that once the evil spirits had been purged from those pesky Brussels sprouts that they traveled right into those like and subscribe buttons. Who'd have thought? Thankfully, you can squash them for good just by smashing them with your fingers. Plus, you'll get a whole host of amazing content in your subscription box every day. It's a win-win. Some babies were changelings. Plenty of bizarre ideas befell the minds of people in the Middle Ages. In fact, many medieval Britons were suspicious that their babies weren't even theirs. And I'm not just talking about taking a paternity test. Some parents believed that their child had actually been taken away by fairy people and substituted with a changeling, a human-like creature found in European folklore. According to legend, a human child might be stolen by fairies out of love or malice, and in some cases, an elderly fairy would be even exchanged so that the old fairy could live a life of comfort being coddled by its new human parents. Once a child had been swapped for a changeling, it may not grow in size and might even possess strange physical characteristics like long teeth or a beard. But how could you know for sure? One test involved putting a shoe in a bowl of soup in front of the baby. If the baby laughed, showing it somehow understood the joke, it was a fairy. Similarly, if you pretended to make a loaf of bread in an eggshell in front of the child and it giggled, it wasn't human. Because, you know, babies never laugh at anything random, right? Suspect babies would then be held over a fire to drive the fairies out or would be abandoned altogether. Some scholars have proposed that this cruel belief stemmed from a lack of understanding about infants afflicted with unexplained diseases, disorders, or developmental disabilities. Man, those were some cruel times. Drinking gold was an anti-aging cure. Nowadays, there are all sorts of creams and serums specially designed to aid anti-aging, but in the 16th century France, there was a far deadlier alternative, drinking gold. Of course, this cure wasn't available to everyone and was mostly reserved for people of nobility. One member of the royal court and King Henry II's royal mistress, Diana de Poitiers, drank a daily tonic of gold chloride mixed with diethyl ether. Six months before she died at the age of 66 in 1566, the French historian Brantome noted that de Poitiers seemed ageless and wrote, I believe that if this lady had lived another hundred years, she would not have aged in her face so well composed as it was. The healing powers of gold had been touted long before de Poitiers discovered it. Roman author Pliny the Elder suggested it was a salve for warts and ulcers, while the ancient Egyptians swore by gold water as an anti-aging remedy. The whole idea stemmed from the fact that gold didn't corrode, which suggested people could enjoy similar longevity by consuming it. 
when an alchemist figured out how to dissolve solid gold into a liquid in the medieval era around the 16th century, it was advertised as a cure-all for everything from epilepsy to mania. But it wasn't until centuries later that people realized gold drinking could be fatal. In fact, when De Portier's body was exhumed, researchers analyzed her hair and concluded that she likely died of chronic intoxication due to her long habit of drinking gold. Keep searching for that fountain of eternal youth, people. We all believed some pretty crazy things as kids. I used to think that I'd end up with an entire watermelon in my belly if I accidentally swallowed a watermelon seed. What's the craziest thing you believed when you were a kid? Let me know down in the comments below. Some animals spontaneously generate. Nowadays, animal birth and reproduction are just part of our basic human understanding, but our forebearers couldn't for the life of them understand how some creatures arrived on Earth. In the 17th century, physician and chemist Jean-Baptiste Van Helmont devised a home recipe for the creation of mice. All that was needed was a soiled shirt and some wheat. Place the shirt at the opening of a jar containing wheat grains, and according to Helmont, the reaction of the leaven in the shirt with fumes from the wheat will, after approximately 21 days, transform the wheat into mice. Sounds legit. A similar recipe for creating scorpions involved carving an indentation into a brick and filling it with basil. Next, cover that brick with another and place the bizarre sandwich in the sun. In just a few days, fumes from the basil acting as a leaving agent will have transformed the vegetable matter into veritable scorpions. These recipes might seem totally wacko, but they spawned from some 2,000 years of false belief in spontaneous generation. In the West, this theory can be traced back to Aristotle, who argued that some animals emerged from putrefying earth or vegetable matter. This was widely accepted in Europe and the Arab world for the next two millennia. Even the greatest minds of the Renaissance and the Enlightenment, including Isaac Newton, believed in it. The theory continued well into the 17th century until Louis Pasteur, the so-called master of microbes, squashed it for good. Pasteur argued in favor of germ theory, which proved that just because you couldn't see microscopic life didn't mean it wasn't there at all. Let's all be glad mice and scorpions don't just appear out of thin air, though. Ginger people would turn into vampires after death. Redheads have never had it easy. Nowadays, ginger people all around the world are embracing their natural hair color, but back in the day, there was more than just playground bullies to worry about when flaunting your unconventional locks. You see, the ancient Greeks believed that redheads would almost certainly turn into vampires after they died. To prevent swaths of gingers from rising from the grave and coming after them with an unquenchable thirst for blood, they burned their bodies to make sure the dead really meant dead. Way harsh, Ty. The thing is, this whole belief was kinda ironic because Achilles, Helen of Troy, and Aphrodite, some of the most prominent figures in Greek mythology, were all said to have red hair in texts like Homer's Iliad. And it wasn't just the Greeks who hated on gingers. The Egyptians also believed that redheads were unlucky and should therefore be sacrificed to eradicate the bad juju. In this case, that meant being buried alive. The perception of ginger people has fluctuated over time, but we can safely assume that redheads drew a lot of attention in ancient times simply because they were harder to come by and were therefore different. As a general rule, different equaled evil back then, and so the myth existed. While no gingers have resurfaced as vampires, unless you count Victoria from Twilight, it's true that redheads need to be more cautious around the sun because the pigment pheomelanin, in which is found in red hair, makes them more susceptible to melanoma. To all the redheads out there, Next time someone hates on your hair, just tell them draining their blood is at the top of your to-do list in the afterlife. Our eyes shoot out invisible beams of light. Sight is a complex thing. It's so complex, in fact, that back in the day, people truly believed that we were only able to see because we shot invisible beams of light from our eyes. It might sound like something only a superhero could do, but according to the ancient Greek philosopher Plato, eye beams were responsible for all human sight. These invisible light beams would bounce off of any object they touched, passing back information to the brain and telling us about what we were seeing before us. This was known as the emission theory, which has since been replaced by the intromission theory that instead explains our ability to interpret the world around us by using light in the visible spectrum. In this case, light is actually reflected by the objects in the environment and back into our eyes rather than the other way around. It may seem ridiculous, but evidence of the whole eye beam thing can be seen throughout history. 
For example, the custom of saluting is said to stem from the habit of Greek soldiers putting their hands up to their face to shade their eyes from the powerful light being emitted from their commander's eyes. It was also thought that the light from the eyes of some animals, like cats, who we now know to have highly reflective eyes, could even be seen in darkness. When two people looked at each other, the belief stated that their eye beams twisted together, which is a pretty uncomfortable thought if you ask me. As the centuries passed and our understanding of the structure of the human eye improved, the emission theory went the way of the dodo. But it seems to have been revived as an aspect of monstrous superhuman capabilities in pop culture. Just look at Cyclops from the X-Men. There was a bull with acid poop. Medieval bestiaries and folk tales feature many implausible creatures that people actually believed in, but none are quite as bizarre as the Bonacon. On first glance, it doesn't look too terrifying. It's pretty much a regular-sized wild bull with inverted horns, but it had a particularly nasty trick up its sleeve, or should I say under its tail. Considering the creature's horns are practically useless in combat, the Bonacon would squirt a stream of acidic poop at its attackers, which would burn them badly enough for it to make its escape. The earliest known reference to this ancient beast is said to be found in Pliny the Elder's Natural History, where he describes it as being found in the region of Paeonia, which roughly corresponds today as being the northern part of Greece and western Bulgaria. Belief in the Bonacon became so popular in medieval times that it was included in many bestiaries, including one, the Aberdeen Bestiary, that notes how the heat of the creature's poop is so strong that it actually sets fire to anything it encounters. Of course, there's no evidence to support the existence of the Bonacon, but it's important to remember that traveling long distances in the Middle Ages was extremely difficult, so most people had to rely on the reports of those who had the resources to do so. That meant there was no way of knowing what was real and what wasn't unless you saw it for yourself. It's a good job this flaming poop bull turned out to be nothing but a fantasy. Lambs grew on trees. There are many instances when a traveler being unable to properly relate what they had seen resulted in imprecise descriptions being accepted as fact, but none are quite as impressive as the belief that lambs grew on trees. According to ancient lore, in the woods of Central Asia, formerly known as Tartary, there existed a mysterious plant known as the vegetable lamb of Tartary. Rather than bearing fruit, atop this long, swaying stalk jutting from the ground was a bleeding, life-sized lamb hovering a few feet off the ground. It may seem ridiculous, but the vegetable lamb of Tartary crops up in ancient Hebrew texts, medieval literature, and even poetry, philosophy, and scientific musings of the Renaissance. One of the first to report on this mythical plant was Sir John Mandeville, who referred to it in his travel writings on Tartary. In Mandeville's imagined anatomy, the plant branched out into several seed pods from which newborn lambs would spring forth. In another variation, each lamb would hover off the ground on a flexible stalk, which allowed it to chomp on the grass below. Once all the vegetation within reach had been eaten, the lamb plant would die. The lambs were particularly vulnerable to wolves, but if a human could procure one by severing the stems with a bow and arrow, it was considered a delicacy. Mandeville's thoughts on the lamb tree were taken very seriously in medieval England, but how did this myth really begin? The cotton plant, first brought over from India, had been described by the ancient Greeks as being like fleeces from the trees. Meanwhile, Alexander the Great's admiral would later write that there were in India trees bearing flocks or bunches of wool. And so the whole thing played out like one long, poorly played game of telephone until people came to their senses and realized that no, lambs did not grow on trees after all. The Forgotten Continent It may seem like we have a pretty good grasp on the world and its landmass, but in the mid-19th century, everything was thrown into question with the idea that humans had somehow forgotten about an entire continent called Mu. You're probably thinking, where could this mythical continent possibly be found? Well, according to those who accepted its existence, it would be located right about here. The theory was first proposed in the late 1800s by an enthusiastic but entirely inaccurate archaeologist named Augustus Le Plongeon. He wrote a treatise claiming that the Mayan civilization had actually originated on the Lost Continent, which was once populated by an ancient civilization, but that it had sunk into the Atlantic Ocean some time ago. He also claimed that the civilization of Egypt was founded by Queen Mu, a refugee from the land's demise, while other refugees had fled to Central America and become the Maya. 
When he died in 1908, British writer James Churchward continued to peddle the myth by claiming that he'd found a bunch of clay tablets in India which contained writings in a lost language that only he and two others could read. According to Churchward, the civilization of Mu thrived from 50,000 to 12,000 years ago, and at the time of its demise, the continent was home to 64 million people. Many people believed in Mu over the years, but archaeologists, scientists, and geologists alike have stridently denied its existence for a few reasons. Firstly, Churchward claimed that a supervolcano had essentially spelled Mu's end, but under the theory of plate tectonics, it's impossible for an entire continent to sink within that time frame. Even changing the shape of a continent, like when Pangaea split, would take millions of years. And if Mu had really existed, then why is there no evidence of it on the ocean floor? It's a fun idea, but I'm afraid to say Moo is a load of old hogwash. Tobacco enemas were a thing. Around the year 1774, doctors William Hawes and Thomas Corgan from London formed what would later become the Royal Humane Society. During the 18th century, this society promoted the rescue of drowning people and paid four guineas to anyone who successfully brought a drowning victim back to life. Around the same time, tobacco had been imported to England from Virginia. It would be chewed, inhaled, smoked in a clay pipe, and, bizarrely, blown up people's butts. American First Nations people had pioneered the use of tobacco enemas in medicine, and when word made its way across the pond, volunteer medical assistants with the society decided to use the procedure to treat half-drowned London citizens who'd been yanked from the Thames. It worked by inserting an enema tube with rubber attachments into the victim and blowing smoke into it. This was thought to warm the drowned person while also stimulating respiration, but of course the whole thing was nonsense. Nevertheless, it became a fashion among European doctors, much like bloodletting, and soon the treatment was being used for headaches, respiratory failure, colds, hernias, abdominal cramps, and later even typhoid fever and cholera outbreaks. Besides being totally useless, tobacco enemas could also have disastrous consequences for the smoke blower. If the practitioner accidentally inhaled instead of blowing during a coughing spell, some of the cholera particles could be swallowed. Mmm, yummy. It wasn't until 1811, when English scientist Ben Brody discovered that nicotine was toxic to the heart, that tobacco enemas went out of fashion. And that, my friends, is where the phrase blowing smoke up your butt comes from. Bloodletting was an effective cure. During less informed times, people were willing to try all sorts of wacky cures for their ailments. Around 3,000 years ago, the Egyptians invented a practice known as bloodletting, which would be continued by the ancient Greeks and Romans and then spread through Europe during the Middle Ages. In fact, this rather grisly cure, which involved applying leeches to a person's body to drain them of their blood, was a thriving industry up until the 19th century. It seems pretty gross, but it all stemmed from the idea that the body, according to Hippocrates, was made up of four basic humors. Blood, phlegm, black bile, and yellow bile. Being ill meant having an imbalance of the four humors, so treatment involved removing an amount of the excessive humor by various means, including bloodletting. Even after beliefs in the four humors faded by the second millennium, bloodletting remained popular. Because surgery was still a crude practice, people turned to the church for medical help. Until in 1163, a church addict forbade monks and priests from practicing bloodletting. And so people turned to an unlikely help, barbers. Barbers performed many functions at the time, including minor surgeries, dental practices, and administering leeches. The barber would coat the desired body part with sugar water, milk, or blood to entice the leeches to start sucking, and each patient could have up to 100 leeches at a time. Thankfully, physicians had started speaking out against the effectiveness of the practice by the 1900s, so don't bother heading to the local pond next time you feel a bit under the weather. Women's bodies weren't designed to handle train rides. Concerns about traveling from A to B have existed since humans learned to walk, but nothing was quite as terrifying as those newfangled locomotives they called trains, especially if you were a woman. When the world's first steam-powered locomotives were unveiled in the early 1800s, men feared that its immense speed, with a top speed of 50 miles per hour, would be so extreme that it would cause a woman's uterus to fly from her body. In 1898, one Berlin doctor even wrote that violent movements of the body can cause a shift in the position and a loosening of the uterus, thus defeating a woman's true purpose in life, i.e. the bringing forth of strong children. Women watching this, feel free to grab your pitchforks now 
Obviously, there are no cases of this actually happening and the flying uterus myth died off pretty quickly. But this irrational fear of female travel didn't end at locomotives. As automobiles gained traction in the early 1900s, they were also seen as equally evil and dangerous. There were no stop signs, warning signs, traffic lights, driver's education, street lights or brake lights, driver's licenses, or posted speed limits. People hadn't exactly figured out left turns yet, and drunk driving wasn't even considered a serious crime. Driving a noisy, erratic car nicknamed Devil Wagons was something of an extreme sport. For that reason, they were definitely not considered suitable for, prepare to eye roll, delicate and fragile ladies, because they wouldn't be able to control themselves inside the vehicle. But fearful reactions to new technology are age old. Some of our biggest concerns are about the dangers of transportation nowadays revolve around stuff like our GPS getting hacked and driving us into a lake. But at least we know trains aren't out to get the entire female species. There were tiny people in sperm. The birds and the bees has always been a delicate subject, but back in the 17th and 18th centuries, scientists thought they had it all figured out. It was simple, in fact. Inside every sperm cell was a tiny little man, which then grew up to be a much larger man or woman. The theory was known as preformationism, and there was a peculiar logic behind it. At the time, how babies formed was really anyone's guess. People warmed to the idea of preformationism because it made logical and mechanical sense. There were tiny people running around in sperm, and those tiny people also had tiny people in their sperm, like some reproductive Russian doll. The competing theory, epigenesis, stated that neither sperm nor the egg were independently alive, but that somehow during the pregnancy they acquired a vital essence that created a human. Of course, this wasn't far off the truth, but people much preferred the much simpler idea that existing copies were just enlarged under the right conditions. When Antoine van Leeuwenhoek, the father of microbiology, became one of the first men to observe sperm under the microscope, he reported that within those individual cells were tiny, folded up individuals. His drawings and descriptions of these tiny infants provided the argument for preformationists for nearly a century. But as people were able to make more accurate observations of sperm cells, eggs, and animal embryos, one thing became clear. There are no tiny men inside sperm. Which of these wacky beliefs surprised or amused you the most? If you've got a hunger for all things historical, why not check out this video next? It's about all the lies you were told by the history books. Thanks for watching.